Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Farooq Hassan is back with a brand new episode of Sky Epilement. Viewers, today I have a very, very special guest. Um, he happens to be one of my batchmates also from National Defense University. A very intriguing personality, a very interesting personality. Currently, he is the president of International Research Council for Religious Affairs. And uh, he's a writer, he's a researcher, he's a trainer, and a very, very interesting personality. May I introduce Mr. Israr Madni to you? Assalamu alaikum, Israr Bhai. Wa alaikum assalam. How are you doing? I'm fine, really. Thank you for joining us. Good, good, good. Uh, Israr Bhai, you've got a lovely office. It's the first time I've come here. Uh, there were so many things that I wanted to talk to you about, and uh, I thought, what better way that we share your views with the world in sky is the limit. Yes, please. So that's why we are here. Uh, you're a very well-traveled man, I know, and you've done a lot of publications also. So I'd like you to speak in length, in detail about all those. But first of all, let's start with your fundamentals. Where did you start from? I believe you went to a madrasa for education. So can you just give us a glimpse of your early childhood? Yeah, um, it's uh, really interesting. Uh, I started my journey of education from a village, Tarnab Charsadda, okay, yes. which is the town of the uh, two great uh, revolutionary leaders, Bacha Khan and Haji Toranze. Okay. Uh, both are the freedom fighters against the British Empire. And this is in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Yeah, this is in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. And uh, studied in a very uh, village school okay. in government and uh, also completed my matric from there. And and the facilities usually are very basic. Oh, there, very you know, basic, like you yeah. You sit under the very tree small, and yeah. uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, uh, if the, especially uh, people come from the foreign or from the Islamabad, so they will see this is a non-formal school, it's okay. not. So uh, after the matric, I joined the madrasa. Mm -hmm. uh, madrasa is the non-traditional institute, a non-formal institute in the South East Asia, mm -hmm. and this is not only in the Pakistan, this uh, based in India, uh, Bangladesh, and now in the other Muslim countries, including Indonesia, Malaysia. So, Southeast Asia, yeah. Gulf mm, also? Yeah, uh, no, the Gulf haven't. The Gulf uh, have their education is a very formal through Different. school, in, and they merge the both religious education and the uh, modern education both. Okay. But in this uh, South Asia, it's uh, working very separately. Okay. Uh, so mm, I started my education, I think, in 2002 from Madrasa. Okay. And it's eight year education. After your matriculation? Yeah. Okay. And the eight year education, it's equal to the master degree in uh, Islamic studies and Arabic studies. So does the Higher Education Commission acknowledge that? Yeah, somehow they are acknowledged this. Okay. okay. Yeah, but uh, always there is a conflict uh, to how to acknowledge this because the system, uh, their curriculum, their credit hours are totally different from the universities or the higher education standard credit hours. So madrasas are recognized by HEC? Like uh, yeah, there is a uh, MOU between the uh, higher education commission and the madrasa boards. They are uh, regulating the madrasa, issuing their degrees and uh, uh, conducting their examination system and all these. So these five boards are registered with the higher education. Commission and the Ministry of uh, Education, okay. both at the federal level. Okay. So this was the eight-year education. Um, five years I studied in a local madrasa that called Tehsilul Quran, and then I joined the Madrasa Hakaniya Kola Khatak. Okay. So the Madrasa Hakaniya Kola Khatak is very well-known institution, uh, not only in Pakistan, uh, especially in the Western media, because of the Hakani network and yes. Hakani's families. Uh, and especially the current uh, Afghan Taliban government in Afghanistan. Um, I think 25 um, people in their cabinet uh, graduate, yeah, graduated from Madrasa Hakkani. Are they your batchmates? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So most of them but are senior, but from the same institution. Okay. So the people are looking uh, to Madrasa Hakkani in the context of Afghanistan. But beside this, this is uh, one of the uh, leading religious institution in Pakistan. And uh, it started from 1947. Oh, so from the birth of Pakistan. Yeah, from the birth of Pakistan. And how many students on average does it have? Uh, yes, they have the graduates, I think 1,500 graduates per year. 
Okay. Yeah, and this is the largest number in the whole world, not only in Pakistan. Okay. It's the big largest number than India, Bangladesh, and many other institutions. So, if I was to say that this is the biggest madrasa in uh, the world, is yeah, that correct? Yeah, yeah, this is correct. Okay. Uh, like uh, in the uh, in the numbers of the uh, graduates, yeah. they have every year. Okay. So, uh, I graduated from that institutions. Uh, and then started, uh, I was selected as a teacher, and after that I was promoted. So you completed eight years of education, yeah. and then you joined the mother as, as a I teacher? As a teacher. What were you teaching? Uh, I was teaching the uh, tafsir, hadith, uh, and Islamic law. Okay. And after that I was promoted as a director of research and publication uh, at the Madrasa Haqqaniya. This is a specific department working on the Islamic law, history, uh, the modern trends in Islamic studies okay. uh, and their monthly magazine is almost publishing from 65 years okay. constantly and uh, uh, one of the Urdu magazines called Al Haq. So I was working as a deputy um, editor okay. uh, in this magazine. So uh, this was um, by working with this research department I was very close to the Maulana Samuel Haq, the principals and and the management of working on the research and publication and for that time my journey start with the research and studies publications writing articles uh, writing blogs and also uh, visiting media houses talking of the islamic issues and etc all wow. these things awesome so tell me how did you so the the main perception generally perception is that usually the students who study in madrasa are not very well versed with the IT, technology, laptop, and all those modern gadgets. So you say that you started writing and, you know, like all these blogs and all. How did you get, uh, you know, uh, towards that side? How did you get attracted towards the tech-savvy side of uh, this world? Yeah, this is a big gap between the mainstream educational institution and madrasa education. Yeah. This is still a very big challenge, yeah. not only in Pakistan and around the Muslim world. And including in India and Bangladesh and many other countries mm -hmm. and including in Afghanistan. But uh, uh, some of the institution like our institution and many other institutions are trying to get connect the mainstream education with the madrasa education mm -hmm. to bridge the gaps between the two different graduates, two different mentalities, mm -hmm. two different school of thoughts mm -hmm. and uh, to learn from each other experiences through different exchange program, capacity building and many other courses, short courses, long courses, etc. So uh, uh, it was very difficult to like uh, understand uh, the current trends, especially in IT technologies yeah. and many other technical courses. Yeah. But from very uh, first date, uh, our uh, vice chancellors, he was uh, very focused on these issues to start the uh, um, computer courses, languages courses, English language courses and a student must learn the technology and all these things. Nice. So in that time, uh, which the concept of the digital library was not too much uh, understandable in the mainstream institution, but we started to digitalize our data, uh, develop the online library. The people have the access to the online fatwa, religious uh, different text, uh, and their understanding, and all these are available online. Now so we have online religious education also. Uh, yeah, they, no, they, they are, our graduates started different online uh, courses mm -hmm. and they're providing the education not only in Pakistan, in the United States, UK, and France, and many where, where the Pakistanis are living. So they are studying from their graduates uh, online through Zoom and many other means. Okay. So tell me, uh, this you adopted uh, uh, or you chose to study in a madrasa out of your own will or because you didn't have any other opportunity so you said that this is the only opportunity so i let me yes uh, this is like one of the, uh, the misconception or misperceptions about the madrasa that the uh, students are coming to madrasa they are underprivileged families or something but the amazing thing is that that when i was studying in madrasa so two or three uh, provincial ministers and their sons were studying with us in madrasas. A lot of uh, millionaires, billionaires, their sons are going to madrasa. And this is the change come from different spiritual groups in Pakistan, like Tablighi Jamaat, and some of the spiritual places that they are uh, aware, the, uh, trying to convince the people to get their son in madrasa as a Hafiz Quran, Alimi Deen, 
and all these things. So, um, like, I didn't see anyone that, uh, that enrolled by force or something. And uh, the madrasa is also, they are conducting their test, their interviews, and as you know, the proper, um, in modern institution, they are taking their test interview, and after a long process, they will select you for the education. So if you are unwilling to enroll in madrasa, so they will didn't provide any opportunity to study there. Starting from very, very basic fundamentals like the village school that you mentioned, then going to a madrasa, and then going abroad for fellowship or for further studies and, uh, you know, like, how was the, the transformation, how was the experience, and how did you, you know, manage it? Yeah, it was very difficult, uh, especially for me. I belongs to a very traditional family and remote area uh, and a traditional madrasa education. Uh, first I visited to, um, I was selected through an interview process for a fellowship uh, that's called uh, the uh, Religion and Conflict mm -hmm. uh, Fellowship. Mm -hmm. And the amazing thing was that, that the uh, that fellowship w that was conducted by the uh, Drew University at uh, New Jersey, okay. United States. Okay. And uh, our dean was, he was a Jew, mm -hmm. religious scholar. Okay. And uh, the participant from uh, Imam, mosque Imam from Palestine, Jews rabbi from Israel, uh, Imams from Egypt, Al-Azhar, mm -hmm. uh, religious Jamal scholar from, yeah, uh, religious scholars from Indonesia, Malaysia. So all these like three Abrahamic religion scholars mm -hmm. were there. And there is like for 35 days, there was a big debate to understanding uh, the inter-religious dialogue, interfaith harmony, yeah, to understand the conflict, what is uh, the religious conflict and what is the political, mm -hmm. or how we differentiate between the religion and political conflict, mm -hmm. and all these things. So that was one of the brilliant experience. I learned a lot, and that uh, like gave me a chance to understand other religion and their perspective directly from their religious leaders and from their region. So it was like uh, one of the um, key program uh, which gave me a lot of opportunities of learning, understanding, and negotiating with the other faith leaders, etc. So this was the first, I think, uh, one of the experience, learning experience. And uh, it was difficult to digest all these contents, very heavy content. But, uh, and that was thanks, the first experience? Yeah, that was the first experience uh, internationally. And uh, uh, some of the experience I have in Pakistan, because in madrasa educations or in, uh, in village education, if you are uh, studying some a subject, so you haven't the experience to uh, negotiate, discuss something with the other school of thought. Mm -hmm. Maybe you are from one school of thought, or uh, maybe political, maybe are religious, maybe of others, maybe of ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to negotiate with the other one. So two different training programs uh, conduct uh, organized by the civil society. So I have the chance to discuss the key uh, sectarian harmony issues and many other conflicts within the Pakistan, within my countries. And uh, after these programmings, I bridged the gap with the other uh, school of thought mm -hmm. and we invited them in our institution and they shared something, their experience, uh, how to promote the religious harmony between diverse uh, school of thoughts and religion and all these and this is was the transformation basically started from that point so tell me Israri, now that you've had so much international exposure and starting from basics uh, you know you are a well-read man now you've been to NDU also what efforts are you doing specifically in your madrasa or in your area to train the students or tell them that the gap that exists can be bridged amicably yeah, uh, first I just, uh, you mentioned in the introduction, introductory remarks about the uh, International Research Council for Religious Affairs. So there is an interesting story behind that also. Mm -hmm. uh, I, in 2013, I was a teacher and director of research and publication as Madrasa Hakania Kola Khatak. And there was a conflict started in uh, the Fata and Balochistan in many regions. Uh, and that was some of the extremist organization are targeting the polio workers especially the ladies uh, who are uh, working for the polio vaccination program. We still have one or two incidents yeah, yeah, occasionally. Yeah, occasionally. So it's still happening. But uh, in that time, it was on the extreme. So um, 
um, and uh, the reason was in that time that uh, one of the uh, doctor uh, used for the uh, military operation by the CIA and uh, Dr. Shaquille Afridi incident, everyone knows about. But there was a misconception about and propaganda about the polio program that this is uh, pro this kind of program is using for something uh, some other purpose. There's a hidden agenda yeah, or something. something. And this was a very natural program run by the government of Pakistan, uh, the Ministry of Health for the and the betterment of our people. people. Yeah. So um, when I studied the literature and the uh, interview a lot of people, including in religious community, tribal leaders, so there is a lot of propaganda and narratives about this program. So I was thinking that there will be a forum to bridge the gaps between these two communities. And I started, um, I bring the doctors and experts from the government officials and bring the religious leaders. And we started negotiations, what the misconception and propaganda about the police. And what are the concerns of both yeah. the groups? And uh, after two days discussions, all the religious leaders was agreed that this is our religious duty to support the polio vaccination program in Pakistan. And they issued the religious statement to support the polio program. They issued video statement. They also uh, vic uh, start vaccination program in this region. And by three years or three and a half years, uh, they diffuse the propaganda through their actions. And the head of jamaat e islami Maulana Samuel Haq, and many, many all top leaders, the, all the religious parties starting supporting this program. Mm -hmm. And after that, uh, the Saudi government acknowledged that initiative, OIC acknowledged that initiative, and they developed an international Islamic advisory group to Jamiat ul Azhar from Egypt and OIC from Saudi Arabia, many other prominent leaders. And they start discussion that this is one of the program that uh, convincing the religious and tribal community on the community level. You, who, who initiated this program? Uh, I personally initiated this it program. It was your own personal initiative? Uh, this was uh, the first initiative from the International Research Council for Religious Affairs. No, we'll come to that. How did you join International Research? And this was the 2013. Okay. And this was the first program uh, mm -hmm. from this forum. And then uh, we, when we work on this issue, so our team understand that the religion and the religious community have very great role in our society. And we need to acknowledge that. We need to use that their role for the betterment of the society, for the awareness, for the understanding, for the peace building, and all these things. And for, after that uh, successful model of the pro, uh, polio eradication program through religious engagement, we started many many programs uh, okay. from this thing. Okay. Okay. So, so this International Research Council for Religious Affairs, it is an NGO. Uh, it's it's a it's an NGO, and uh, it is funded by. International donors, United Nations, yeah. and all. Can yeah, you tell us a bit about yeah, the formation? Obviously, yeah. Obviously, it's a uh, non-government organization working as a think tank on the policy level and the on the community level both. Okay. Yeah, and uh, most of our work to bridge the gaps, mm -hmm. if, uh, the gaps in the policy level, if the gaps in the community level programs. So we are working with the international community, we are working with the local partner, we are working with the government, government of Pakistan, okay. Council of Islamic Ideology, formerly work with NACTA and many other institutions in Pakistan. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, most of the work uh, are uh, working the uh, to religious engagement. Okay. So we have the diverse program of the interfaith harmony, democratic transition as Muslim world, religious freedom. You've been heading it as the president for the last uh, oh, four years. I four years. But you've been associated with it. Yeah, since because I'm one of the founding member of this organization, and the, I told you about the uh, foundation history. Mm -hmm. That was the polio eradication program through religious engagement, okay. and I haven't the experience of the development sector and international development sector before 2013. That was my first experience and mm -hmm. I started and uh, after that uh, I like um, I attended many fellowship trainings and also developed a lot of content uh, in uh, like books, uh, trainings, manuals, organized a lot of trainings for university student, madrasa student, etc. all from this forum after mm -hmm. 2013. Awesome, awesome. So, um, okay, um, let me just go back a bit in time. Uh, tell me, Sarvi, this madrasa uh, education, uh, tell us something more about it. What kind of syllabus do you have? What are the courses? How is it different from the traditional or the conventional educational system? Yeah, uh, uh, I have some interesting uh, data I, um, and it's very important to share with you guys. 
and also I write about it in, uh, in mainstream media. Uh, the madrasa education uh, some people are asking is pure religious education or not yes so my the response misconce the yeah. conception is that it is pure religious education okay so the amazing thing is that that if you see the curriculum of madrasa 60 yeah. percent of the education is secular that is logic mm -hmm. that is philosophy uh, and if you see the poetry that is uh, if someone yeah i can't share uh, mm -hmm. what's the poetry mm -hmm. from the literature we are studying in madrasa and uh, i see uh, there is a dictionary used in madrasa that was written by a christian scholar uh, there is a book uh, in the literature uh, especially the classical literature that was written by a non-muslim scholars uh, and there they, is part of the there curriculum. is a part of madrasa and in sunni madrasa like uh, in sunni tradition school there are like two major, uh, two main school of thought in muslim school like Shia tradition and Sunni tradition. But in Sunni tradition, there are seven books of logic and philosophy written by the Shia scholars. They are teaching in the madrasa of the Sunni tradition. It's very balanced. So, so the amazing thing is that, that the um, uh, curriculum in the madrasa, I think if the 60% of the secular subject are very technical subject, they haven't the, any um, uh, link with the uh, religious political thought or etc. all these things. And uh, this is not only from uh, this time or from 10 or 15 years. I think it's more than 300 years ago it started from that time. And then when the madrasa, first time the madrasa was founded in Farangi Mahal uh, in 1700 century. And from that, then after uh, the um, political movements, uh, again the British Empire uh, in 18, uh, 18th centuries and later on this mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. And after the Pakistan, the mm -hmm. same curriculum. If you see the amazing thing, the curriculum in Madrasa is Pakistan and uh, um, Afghanistan, uh, India, uh, Bangladesh, and many other countries. They will be very similar to each other. Maybe there are 10 to Slight 20 percent difference. uh, differences, but most of them are the same. Okay, okay. So, w what do you feel are the key challenges in this Madrasa education system? Yeah, uh, there is a lot of challenging. Um, uh, I think there is some challenges on the policy level mm -hmm. and some uh, challenges on the uh, educational level. Mm -hmm. At the policy level, so there is a lot of misunderstanding in Pakistan about the policy level regarding madrasa education. Mostly our policy level debate started from the registration and end on the registration. But uh, the if you see the Madrasa Reforms Initiative or Madrasa Enhancement Re Initiative, mm. so there will be need on the curriculum development, teacher training, classroom management, uh, equal opportunities to uh, all the graduates they are graduating from the Madrasa. So they have the access to the uh, government jobs mm -hmm. or the uh, mainstream job market. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of uh, issues. One there, of the major there, yeah. How many madrasas are there in Pakistan? Yeah, this is uh, one of one of the important questions, uh, in, uh, especially in the madrasa enhancement initiatives. That is about the like uh, there is a confusing number mm -hmm. about it, and uh, uh, the, the government number sometimes is different okay. from the actual numbers. Okay. You know but the actual number? Yeah, I think this thirty-two thousand uh, madrasa rounds, and uh, four million students are studying there in Pakistan. And, uh, this is all the, over Pakistan. Huh? Yeah, and uh, last year uh, the graduates uh, around thirty, more than thirty thousand. Thirty thousand per annum. Yeah. So, but uh, I think the government figure is around twenty-eight thousand, if I'm not mistaken. Twenty-nine thousand. The, the government, I think, two to three thousand is different the from difference the official. Is there. And this is not like uh, the issue. This is the issue of the understanding of their curriculum. That from which you can consider some there is a mass schools. So some people are considered as a madrasa. Some are not considered a madrasa, so there is a difference. Okay. Yeah. And and there's a process going on of registration of madrasas yeah. by the government of Pakistan. What does that entail? What do you mean when you say that okay, this madrasa is registered and this is not registered? Yeah, there is two type of registrations of madrasa. One is about the uh, their madrasa, their own boards. Mm -hmm. uh, that is now the number of total boards are ten. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, the the second one is the government registrations. So the madrasa boards uh, they registered madrasas with their own boards. They mm -hmm. have their headquarters. 
they have their examination system mm. they had the mou with the ministry of education and higher education commission mm. this is one they are privately doing and what, what the curriculum is it approved by the government uh, ministry of education or is it not at all driven by uh, no uh, the recent debate was like uh, as uh, you know uh, the director directorate general of religious education yes. uh, 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 dr gulam kamar dr gulam kamar uh is trying to uh, connect the madrasas and also introduce the single national curriculum uh, in the basic classes but the madrasa like recently announced that we will enroll uh, a student in darsa nizami in eight year education after the matric class mm-hmm. so this is you know, uh, they are also supporting the mainstream education till matric class and then after that they will start their religious education okay yeah so the plans of the director general and the ministry of education they are trying to register madrasa first with the ministry of education then also started some technical education uh, and also uh, provide some uh, teachers of the mainstream education like science iit physics chemistry english language and all these things in the basic classes not in the higher classes because the higher uh, classes curriculum of madrasa is highly loaded and uh, a lot of uh, subjects are there okay and is there any concept of since you studied in a madrasa person yourself is there any concept of a vocational training system whereby you uh, learn the basic skills of let's say any uh, you know any skill uh, like plumbing or Uh, how to fix uh, a car car you know like being a mechanic or something like is there any concept yeah there is a, a need in madrasa and there is a concept and some of the madrasa are feeling that they, there is a lot of need of such kind of technical yeah. education there is a lot of but demand probably, also internationally yeah. but the problem is about the funding uh, because it's all about the government mm-hmm. uh, and there is a gap uh, as i already mentioned on the policy level how to deal with madrasa in this field Mm-hmm. but the interesting thing is that that uh, some of the madrasa started their own initiatives like uh, in islamic banking mm-hmm. field the mm-hmm. sharia advisor or the religious mm-hmm. advisor yeah. uh, i think is the 80% are madrasa graduates okay. because some of the madrasa started their own uh, economic classes and they linked with the uh, universities including iba in karachi university etc like darulum karachi they have their uh, own economic uh, center and after the uh, graduation they trained their student in three year education about the economic issues and islamic banking muzaraba murabaha musharaka and all this uh, stuff for the teaching and the modern trends and all these things so i think now um, this is one of the major issue the second one one of the madrasa started the journalism and the proper two year mm. journalism classes mm. uh, and uh, how to uh, blogging writing uh, youtube how to use the youtube and all these things some of the madrasas are like uh, uh, female madrasas mm-hmm. especially this is you now the growing uh, madrasa in pakistan uh, and much more fast than the male madrasa growing much more faster yeah. than the yeah okay so uh, they started like technical education uh, embroidery and all these thing teaching so uh, uh, a lady if she graduated graduated from the madrasa she is she is a skillful she can um, understand the tailoring embroidery and many other technical skills okay so uh, like all the students who go to a madrasa are they equally trained or do you have specialization also so let's say it's 8 years education you said so after let's say 5 years i want to do specialize in economics so i have special courses for economics Uh, i want to specialize in arts uh, or or on a, in technology in it is is there a stream like that or is it just that all graduates of madrasa are equally capable and the same courses and all no i think it's uh, like uh, the basic curriculum of 8 years or 9 year or 10 years are same absolutely same. same across but all the madrasas yeah. but after the graduation they have specializations Uh, after like, doing your 8 years yeah. then you have specialized specialization like specialization in islamic law ah. jurisprudence uh, specialization in hadith some of the specific like specialization and this very small institution are like uh, 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 offering the degree and the finance and etc or the journalism and but uh, and they, like mostly in their holidays they are offering some special courses to understand all these things like journalism it skills and many other things so at the moment there is no regulatory body in pakistan which controls the curriculum of each and every of these 32000 madrasas 
how do you how does anyone ensure that the curriculum being rolled out in all these 32000 madrasas is the same because obviously everyone operates as a as an autonomous body as a you know independent body is there any any kind of um, cohesion or um, you know collaboration between madrasas and they like the, okay this is the level that we have to maintain and this is this is the course that we are doing you know uh, if you ask about on the state level, on the policy level, on the government level, so my response is no. No. Okay. But uh, if you see in them uh, in their madrasa or their private boards, so they have uh, a committee and that is uh, the curriculum reforms committee. Are uh, so they are constantly uh, uh, looking all these content. Uh, but the uh, interesting thing is that that there is nothing modern things are the new things in the madrasa um, curriculum most of like the curriculum and the books that they are teaching in the madrasa they are very technical and they are from like long history 200 years ago 300 years 800 years ago they were written so that is basically the understanding of the primary classical text of the religion okay to understand that okay. so that most are very technical books and they haven't like the relation or link with the current political thoughts or extremist ideology etc okay yeah is politics also taught as a subject in madrasas? If you see like uh, jamaat e islami have very small numbers, but the jamiyat ulama islam, mm -hmm. uh, Maulana Fazlur Rahman group and uh, others, so they have a lot of uh, influence on the madrasa. Their followers, their leaders are mostly graduated from madrasa. Okay. If you see their mainstream leadership, so all of them have graduated from madrasa. Okay. Uh, we are in conversation with Mr. Asrar Madni, a very, very interesting topic. Uh, we have to take a short break, but once we come back from the break, I'd like to ask you, uh, Mr. Asrar Madni Saab, that what are the key initiatives and what are the key projects that uh, your institution, International Research Council for Religious Affairs, has undertaken and what progress level has been made? But right now, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Welcome back viewers, this is Farooq Hassan and you're watching Sky's the Limit and I have Mr. Asrar Madni with myself as a guest today who is the President of International Research Council for Religious Affairs. Uh, Asrar Bhai, uh, what are the key initiatives and key projects that this institution has undertaken and what's the progress level? Yeah, uh, mostly I'm not working uh, as a traditional uh, think tanks or organization are working. Mm -hmm. The first I, uh, mostly I'm looking the uh, in my history and my journey, what are the key challenges and issues who the madrasa graduates are facing mm -hmm. in their career mm -hmm. uh, and their goals. So first I uh, like uh, started uh, that what are the key challenges so I read all the, uh, I note down all these challenges for a madrasa graduate and then uh, I organized a series of programs for them. So the basic things are uh, about the exposure. So we started like some of the mosque imam and madrasa teacher training mm -hmm. uh, to uh, what is the uh, issue of the dialogue, the principles of dialogue, how to uh, negotiate with different diverse and faith communities within Pakistan, within other school of thoughts and uh, then the peace building program on the community level through these religious scholars, the awareness program like the polio awareness program, health awareness program, educational programs and all these things. So we start the first model is about the understanding the things, then uh, the second model is the research about the core issues, the third one is the consultative meeting with the experts, academia, scholars and practitioners. And the fourth one is the capacity building program, how to train all these uh, targeted communities. Mm -hmm. And the fifth one is about the community engagement program, how to link this uh, national level program with and the community level. So this is the whole the, the cycle of the all projects that mm -hmm. IRCRA is doing for the last 10 years. So let me explain like about some of the key projects, like yes. one is the sectarian harmony. 
the problem in pakistan it's not the interfaith issues the uh, i think the uh, other faith communities like hindus christians and uh, buddhist and many others community uh, sikhs they are living like in good condition but there are always a small conflict between uh, the intra faith communities you are talking about intra religious uh, you know yeah. societies or intra religious uh, faith you know they yeah. are together yeah but there's a problem with the intra faith intra faith yeah okay so the intra faith community uh, we are trying to uh, we develop the first uh, we consult with the experts uh, we uh, did a community survey research what are the key issues and misunderstanding and misperception uh, of one sects against other sects yeah. and how they are thinking negatively or they are they have their perceptions or something they are following the propaganda news or fake news against other mm. or there is something the issues uh, or the conflicts happening from the head speech so what are the key head speech or what are the key narratives mm -hmm. so we first identified that and then we developed a counter narrative or alternate narrative or the correct uh, narrative yeah so to interpret the uh, correct interpretation of the religion uh, to develop the uh, to bridge the gaps between the both communities to cre uh, create a clear understanding of each sect and what are the head speech which creating the tension between the both communities okay so uh, we developed the narrative and that was reviewed by the 300 top religious scholars of the pakistan from uh, all the from faiths. all the uh, faith leaders and they said yes this we all are agreed on that and you need to start your capacity building program so we developed a um, capacity building program we trained the mosque imam we trained the madrasa teachers and uh, from the diverse sect for the interesting thing is that when we are recruiting uh, the participant for the workshops so we have very clear criteria that uh, four person from one sect school of thought four from other from so when we are training the 20 person so this will be divided in four to five school of thought and the representation of the all school of thought will be there and the tra the selection of the trainers they will be also belongs from the diverse school of thought mm -hmm. not from specific school of thought mm -hmm. so the impact of that program is interesting that uh, the Salafi and the Shia school of thought are uh, getting together and supporting in Muharram each other. Um, there, uh, if there is uh, any threat or issues to the law enforcement agencies or the police in maintaining the peace in Muharram and many other religious days, so these religious communities are trying to support the local government or the police station in maintaining the peace in the society. Uh, some of these religious scholars started the exchange program with the other school. So they bring their madrasa students to the other school of thought madrasa yeah. and they are uh, talking about the issues of the dialogue, diversity, peace building and etc. That happens? Yeah, that's happening. And sometimes they are uh, writing the blogs or something. Uh, after all these programmings, uh, like we learned that there is a lot of uh, religious community uh, through our other partners that we developed that they are supporting the national initiatives they are supporting the peace building they're uh, talking about the uh, religious harmony of the respect for diversity respect for minorities and all these things in their blogs in their writing in their speeching speeches in their friday sermons in their sunday sermons uh, and the interesting thing is that if there is any uh, festival is coming if they are the holy if they are coming from the um, uh, other minority special days so they are celebrating with each other uh, sharing their good gestures being a pakistani being a, their equal citizen and all these things and this is one of the uh, major effect we are seeing in our training alumni is that they are doing uh, on the community level so which is bringing very, a change yeah a positive and change this is very positive change and this is the transformation uh, we are seeing in our society within our in uh, within our youth uh, from the not only from uh, KP and Pata, from Balochistan to Karachi, Sindh, uh, Punjab, Gilgit Baltistan, and including Kashmir. Very nice, awesome. That's that's great, and I wish Godspeed that uh, you know uh, all the other initiatives that you mentioned, uh, they need to be implemented on a war footing so that you know we have a more harmonized society and everyone works for the betterment of Pakistan. Yeah. 
some uh, of the initiatives uh, like uh, that is uh, very specific about like the religious freedom what are the key issues of uh, religious freedom in the region in in south asia for that matter i think it's very interesting and uh, as i mentioned this is two types of like uh, the issues one is domestic and one is an international like uh, what is pakistan is uh, doing uh, in the domestic issues at state level so i think it's a role model initiative for last three or five years that mm -hmm. we are happening like pakistan opened the kartarpur uh, corridor yeah. Yeah, yeah. it is like one of the uh, biggest initiative in the whole region for the uh, religious harmony respect for other faith getting them access for their spiritual uh, yes. prayers and all these things Uh, another one is the supreme court decisions came to protect the minorities pakistan also established the national minority uh, uh, commission on the federal level uh, same the ministry of interfaith harmony doing the same job the council of islamic ideology these are a lot of uh, the uh, national initiatives are happening on the uh, country level but uh, whenever there is at the society level there is still the issues there is still the propaganda there is still the misconception and misperceptions so but we are still unable uh, to um, present the pakistan initiative on the international level so my work is first to understand the issue of the religious freedom in this society what are this so the basic uh, issues as you asked that um, there is a misunderstanding no exchange program no exchange ideas uh, some people are still living in their tribal area they haven't any meeting with the other school of start uh, and they don't like thought. to yeah uh, and uh, so all of them are living in their in some own, area in the comfort zone own silos yeah in some area there is a very good example if they are living together uh, and they have mm -hmm. a lot of mm -hmm. success stories and how they are respecting each other as i mentioned the ircr programs that how the people are transforming but there is still issues at the society level and this is the lack of education the lack of understanding the lack of inter religious dialogue the lack of uh, um, education uh, educational exchanges uh, and the lack of opportunities mm -hmm. uh, so all these uh, issues are the amazing thing i visited uh, uh, like uh, khaybar uh, ex fata district and the tira valley it's very near to the afghanistan border and it's six hour driving from peshawar so the amazing thing was that i met with the hindus and sikh community there mm -hmm. and they were very happy and they have very close relation with the majority community in that tribal mm -hmm. area and and i have they have the proper access to education proper access to the schools you, there is no college university is there but they have a very close relation from very long time so there are some indigenous model in pakistan exist uh, and we need to learn and focus on that and we need to uh, the best list listen learned we understand from that program we need to implement our mainstream education the concept of religious extremism can also go down uh, you know like uh, scholars can help reduce the tension between different uh, faiths uh, different religions for that matter and now the world is becoming a global village there's a lot of focus on uh, religious tourism also and kartarpura is a live example of that not only has pakistan opened its heart uh, towards uh, sikh yatri sikh pilgrims by you know opening up this corridor and giving them access to their religious uh, sacred site but there's nankana sahib also and we have a lot of heritage sites in uh, texila yeah. with the uh, you know like statues of uh, buddha the swat takbai yeah, yeah. so so i think it, it can be we pakistan can prosper as a nation further if we develop on this concept what do you think yeah it's really important in the new world uh, especially as you mentioned that we are living in a global village yeah. so uh, this is uh, not only about the religious tourism it's about also the religious diplomacy mm -hmm. the traditional dip the uh, the the formal diplomacy uh, is now like it's the time to end that one and the informal diplomacy is now started and it's the most important is the religious diplomacy mm. is the people is coming to pakistan uh, through kartarpur the sikh yatris if they are coming from canada united states india and many other countries so they will understand how uh, the people are welcoming 
the pakistani people are welcoming they are providing shelters hotels and all the facilities so that it will be create a good perceptions yeah. about my countries for last few decades you know there is a lot of uh, misconception propaganda and in international media about the um, uh, peace in pakistan the conflict and the war in neighbors so we need to uh, open much more uh, that area uh, especially in the takhbai this is like the first university in the human history uh, of the buddha civilization or the gandhara civilization so that is in takhbai mardan so uh, there is a lot of areas and stuff that we need to um, um, invite the global community uh, to visit these sites number one and the second about the religious diplomacy yeah yeah we have how like can it improve the connectivity and development in the region what do you think yeah the they diplomacy. say i think the uh, development connectivity regional connectivity uh, you see the cpec model uh, or the build road initiative model so this is like infrastructure model for the uh, connectivity of the region yeah but we need to connect ideologically we need to understand ideolo- ideologically so we need to focus on the religious diplomacy but mm-hmm. why because if you see the afghanistan so most of their uh, leaders are studied in the past in pakistan in their religious educations and all these mainstream education so we need to f- uh, when we are talking with the other countries about the conflict and the issues so we need to engage the religious uh, communities because they have a lot of influence on this uh, region the same with the uh, east border and the west border the same uh, there is like the chinese there is a lot of peoples uh, they are uh, following the buddhist uh, civilization and all these things so there are spiritual places are located mm. in pakistan yes. Yes. so if they are visiting their uh, their uh, rich heritage and all these things so this will be connect the people and uh, you know now the people to people diplomacy people to people connectivity is much more important than others and especially in this current world, current world. that we live in absolutely uh we coming towards the end of the interview uh, sir very much as i would like to talk a lot with you uh, this is a very interesting topic but we have a paucity of time just one last question before i uh, you know close the interview uh you said there are about 32000 madrasas in pakistan is it a growing number like every year is there an increase or is it a stable stagnant number and what are the formalities or requirements if someone wants to open a madrasa he can just next day in the morning he wakes up and he opens the madrasa or is there a formal requirement uh, or a procedure that he has to go through yeah the uh, madrasa is growing uh, it's not like the specific number and every year it's growing because there are a lot of graduates that are coming so some of them going to mass some are going to the government schools some are uh, joining uh, the normal labor market some of joining uh, some of initiate some business entrepreneurship and many many things mm. but uh, some of them are trying to open their own madrasa because their family are respecting or their families are trying to support them to open the madrasa or the society need where he belongs the to the local area yeah, the local areas. areas and all these things but uh, uh, if you see what's like uh, the specific established madrasa you call him and it has the credibility in the society mm. so at least it takes to 30 to 50 years Uh, in development so of a are... credible institution oh. because um, and uh, you can open a madrasa today and tomorrow you can say just to enroll with us because you need a credibility of your education uh, your understanding of the uh, madrasa education uh, the teachers what you have the curriculum what you provide uh, the the standard of living or building it's not like uh, much more focused in the madrasa education but the teacher and the curriculum and all these things that is very important in madrasa tradition just before we close anything that you would like to say to the youth of pakistan there will be a lot of young people watching you on the screen right now what message would you like to give yeah my message is very clear that i started uh, my journey from uh, a small village school and no alhamdulillah i get foreign education foreign education and also i'm going to for master and in international educations so all these uh, efforts uh, that we need to be struggle always be positive and open our minds for dialogue discussions and respect each other so this is my learning of my life and i'm uh, it's always open the doors to me and for all these opportunities 
Absolutely correct. What a beautiful message. Sabe, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate thank you it. For your and time. keep on doing the good work that you're doing. I wish you Godspeed in all these initiatives that you have undertaken. Viewers, this was uh, Israel Madni, the President of International Research Council for Religious Affairs, an enlightened scholar, has done a lot of publications, he's, he's a trainer also. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Inshallah ta'ala, Farooq Hassan will see you in another exciting episode of Sky is the Limit. Till then, Allah Hafiz.